Oh look, I, I was going to welcome you up and you're already up. Oh, Barry, do you know what I love about Barry, how I'm excited to hear from Barry today, is because he's so enthusiastic and he's just proved my point. <laughs> love it. Should we give him a welcome anyway? <laughs> Wonderful. Here you go. Morning. Oh, no, 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 you, well, you can if you want, quick, make it quick. Yeah, I'll make it quick. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for Barry. We thank you that you've been with him as he's been preparing this word. We thank you for everything that you've put into him, his enthusiasm, his love for, for you, his love for scripture. And we just pray that that shines out and it just encaptures us today. Amen. 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 Wonderful, thank you. Once again, good morning. And the boys and girls and the young people are in today, so... Uh, for the young people's sake, I'm going to be talking about four animals, okay? And they're very important Bible animals, and they're to we're told in the Bible that they're very wise. So now, uh, there's a bar of chocolate for any of young people who can not just remember the animals, but tell me what the animals mean, what the Bible is going to tell us about these animals, okay? But before we get to that part, let me just say that we are, thank you for that, through We Three Kings, I didn't request that, but we're talking about the wise men. Well, we were, oh, yes, we were, we're here again, thank you. Uh, the wise men. If I wanted a text for next year, I suppose this would be one of the many texts that we could use to think about this coming year. It simply says this, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise making the most of the time because the days are evil. Wise men still seek Jesus. Comes from those verses in the book of Matthew, which we know very well. When the wise men saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they went home by a different way. Wouldn't it be great if every one of us went home a different way, a different person? Every time I come to church, I pray that God the Holy Spirit would speak to me so that when I go home, I'm different from when I came. The wise men, wise men went home a different way. My prayer is that we'll all go home a little bit different because God has spoken to us maybe through the worship or through the word. So here we have it. Wise men, who were they? Well, they were good and holy men. They sought truth. They were wise. What is wisdom? Which is the big question. The village fall a couple of hundred years ago was known when they offered him a sixpence or a penny. You young people wouldn't even know what a sixpence is. But when they offered him a large amount of money or a small amount of money, he always chose a small amount of money. And everybody said he's a village fool. Except that hundreds and hundreds of people came and did the same thing. So he ended up very wealthy. Who was the wise man? What is wisdom and what is foolishness? That's what we're looking at. We're looking at four animals that the Bible describes as very wise. I've never been on a safari, been to lots of zoos, but if you go on a safari, I'm told that you will look for five of the biggest animals. That's the, the lion and the, the giraffe and the rhinoceros, I think, and an elephant. Well, the Bible, when it's talking about wise animals, chooses the very smallest of animals. We'll look at those in a little while. My question is, how can I be wise in 2024? I was talking to Susan about what I'm talking about. She said, oh, I've got a little word about wisdom. Susan, will you just join me? This is not a preach. This is a two-minute thought from Susan. This is my wife. Best-looking girl in the church. I'm supposed to say that. <laughs> you didn't say it was two minutes. Um, well, I actually asked Barry, what are you preaching on? And he said, the wise men. So I started to look at the word wisdom. And I found, interestingly, the use of the word wisdom steadily declined from the early 1800s and gradually started to increase from the late 20th century. A bit useless information there, but I'll throw it out. And I've realised that scholars throughout the ages have discussed and they've debated what it means in its simplest form, in its most complex form. 
it's been defined by many in many different ways and viewed from many different perspectives from mythological to educational to psychological to religious and so on and i had a look on amazon and there are all manner of books on wisdom from the academic to the devotional the dalai lama has one called the little book of wisdom and also by the same title is one written by jane austen but two that caught my eye were both called Practical Wisdom. The first was written by Professor Barry Schwartz, an American psychologist, and it was published only in 2010. And it's listed as a reasoned and urgent call to embrace and protect the essential human quality that has been drummed out of our lives, wisdom and it outlines how to identify and cultivate our own innate wisdom in our daily lives. <clears throat> the second book called Practical Wisdom was simply listed, Plain Advice for Plain People. I thought, that's the book for me. It's, it was originally a collection of writings written under the pseudonym John Plowman, and it was published in 1869. Does anybody know who used the pseudonym John Plowman. He knows because I told him, but he didn't. Okay, it was used by Charles Spurgeon, Baptist preacher, 19, um, 1834 he was born. And many will know his quote on wisdom. He said, wisdom is the right use of knowledge. To know is not to be wise. Many men know a great deal and are all the greater fools for it. But to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. He no doubt preached on Luke 2.52 many times. It says, Jesus kept increasing. Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. And he no doubt echoed Paul's words to the Colossians and to those that were in his charge. And I'm going to read those now. Colossians 1, 9 and 10. We have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now more than ever in today's society, I think we need this. So let this be our prayer for ourselves and for our church in 2024. And that thought is where I'm going now. How to increase in wisdom. I've been on the road for quite a long time. Some of you have as well. But we never stop learning. We never stop increasing in wisdom. So my question now is how can I be wise in 2024? And to help me with that, we're going to go to these four creatures. We're told that they're all four wise animals. Let's read about these four wise animals and then ask the question, what can we learn about these animals that will help me in the next year to be wise and to walk humbly with my God? Here are the four animals. It says they're in Proverbs, if I, my clicker's working, in which it's not, in which case you're going to have to press the button at the back, please, to get me to the next slide. Okay, just press the button to the next slide, otherwise you're in trouble. You're not in trouble because I can use my notes. Okay, it's not working, I'll read it to you. Turn that off then, that will turn. No? Tom will help us to get that working. Here's the verse in Proverbs. Are we there? No? Okay, here we go. Four things, four things on earth are small, yet they are extremely wise. Ants are creatures of little strength, so there's the first animal, yet they store up their food in the summer. Conies or rock badgers are creatures of little power, yet they make their home in the crags or the rocks. Locusts have no king. Yet they advance together in ranks. A spider can be caught with the hand, 
yet it is found in kings' palaces. Four animals, and we have them. This is not working, so Tom, you're going to have to press a button every time I need the slide changing, okay? Here are the four animals. Ants, conies, locusts, spider. I love ants. Got a book on ants. Anybody want to borrow that book later? I know you, you like the book on that. Right? Want to look at that while I'm preaching? I'll just think about it, okay? Ants are incredible creatures. Do you know that there are 13,800 species of ants? Did you know that? Did you know that the smallest ant can't be seen by the naked eye? The biggest ant is as big as your hand. So ants are incredible. They can lift 50 times their own weight. That means you could go out to the car park and lift your dad's car if you were an ant. Because they're very incredible creatures. But what we're told in the Bible, two main things about ants in the Bible, is number one, not to be lazy. You go to the ant, you slug them. So study at school. I'm picking on you because you're on the front row. Okay? You've got to work. He's going to move. Uh, you've got to work hard at school, kids. The Bible says, go to the ant, you sluggard. Oh, well done. Thank you. Oh, we're there. Okay. Uh, go to the ant. Work hard. But in the verse that we've just read here, we're told that the ant is wise. God chose the ant to give us an illustration about wisdom. Now, what is it about the ant that is wise? Well, we're simply told that the ant prepares for the winter by collecting food in the summer. In other words, the ant prepares for the future. I need to ask you grown-ups as well as the children, have you prepared for your future? I know some Christians who spend all their time maintaining the past. Something went wrong in the past, that you did something bad in the past. Last year maybe you did something or said something you wished you hadn't said. My Bible says forget what lies behind and press on to what is ahead. I don't think there's anyone in this room here who didn't say or do something last year that you regret, that you wish hadn't gone that way. But my Bible says forget what lies behind and press on. So the ant doesn't maintain the past. Or doesn't, what is it? Yes, mend the past, try to mend the past all the time. I know some other Christians they are only concerned with today. I know some long words. And that, I know that word existentialism, which basically means living for today. Get whatever you can out for today. But the ant doesn't just try and mend the past or maintain the present. If you're only concerned with today, then my Bible tells me that you're a fool. Jesus only called one person a fool. And that was a successful businessman. He was in, into agriculture and he built himself big barns. He had his bank balance full. And he said, oh, look, my barns are full. I have to tear them down and build bigger ones. And Jesus, this is the words of Jesus, says, you fall tonight. Your soul is required of you. In other words, he hadn't prepared for his future. The ant prepares for his future. That's what makes him wise. There are three kinds of questions. I, 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 I have favourite authors from time to time. Last couple of years I've been reading R.T. Kendall. And just last week I read the, this, these words from R.T. Kendall. It says here, the kindest, listen, the kindest questions you can put to anybody are these. Where will you be in a hundred years' time? Number two, do you know for sure if you were to die today, you would go to heaven. Number three, if you were to stand before God, and you will, he says, and he were to ask you, and he might, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Now, they're kind questions because they're challenging you to think about what happens when you leave this earth. My dearest friend David left this earth this last year. Have you prepared for your future? The ant has prepared for the future, not just mending the past, maintaining the present, but looking forward to the future. I mentioned to you that the ant lifts up 50 times his own weight. You see these ants carrying incredible weights. I challenge you as I challenge myself, this coming year, what about doing something bigger than you for God this next year? What about thinking bigger thoughts than you thought in the previous year? What about expecting great things from God? 
or attempting great things for God. You adults get a bar of chocolate if you come to me and tell me where that quote comes from. It wasn't me. But this coming year, if I'm going to be wise, help me to forget what lies behind. Help me to make sure that I've prepared for my future. And I want to, the best way you can prepare for my future is to read, read my Bible and pray and talk to Jesus every day. It's not rocket science. Stay close to Jesus. The next animal. See if it works. Oh. oh, it does. Look at that. Susan and I have been married for 92 years. And so this last... Um, <laughs> Two weeks ago, we, it, was our, it was our wedding anniversary, so we went to London for three days, and one of the things we did is we went to the Nat Natural History Museum, I recommend it. In the hall, great big hall. You're nodding, yes, it's a great museum. Um, in the great hall of the mammals, I went to look for this animal because I knew I was gonna be speaking about it. It's called a coney or a rock badger, or depending on what version of the Bible you read. It's a very small animal. You can go and see it in the Natural History Museum. It's a relative of the rabbits. It's not, not much bigger than a rabbit, but it cannot run. It's also related in some way to the mole, but it can't dig. So why would the Bible, using that animal as an illustration, say it's wise? What can I learn about this little creature, as I've learned from the ant? Well, it lives in the rocks. And in the rocks, there are eagles that can see from a great height. Best eyes I ever they can see a rock badger and they swoop down and before it was known it would be snapped up and eaten. So what is it about this tiny little rabbit-like creature that makes it wise? Well, quite simply, it stays close to the rock. Oh, you had a hand up, yes? I'll come back to you, yes. Anybody else helping me in my sermon? Put your hand up and I'll come to you. Oh, hang on, we have some. Oh dear, this is going to double the length of the sermon, isn't it? Come on, yes? Um, uh, um, to stop reading something, um, the animal. Well, that's not a bad answer. I didn't understand it, but I'm sure it's a very good answer. You've got the answer now. Isn't it like um, he's chosen the right place to live? Yes, exactly right. He's chosen the right place. the sand, you know that story in the Bible. Okay, very well done. He stays close to the rock. You Christian adults here know exactly what I'm talking about. Stay close to the rock this coming year. You want to know what wisdom is? Stay close to Jesus. We sing that old song, or we used to, we don't sing the old songs anymore. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. Best bit of advice I could give to you this coming year is to prepare for the future. That's the end. The second bit of advice is to position yourself staying close to Jesus. I tell you, being a successful Christian is not rocket science. It's not complicated. The youngest child here could teach us lessons just by staying close to Jesus. And I ask myself, as I ask you, did last year I wander away from Jesus? Did I spend a week without looking at my Bible? Did I spend a week without talking to Jesus? If I want to know what it is to be a successful, victorious Christian this coming year, and I use those words carefully because the word success and, uh, 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 is in the Bible, I just simply need to stay close to the rock because there's a lot of danger out there. You don't see the danger. That little rock badger doesn't see the eagle. Before he knows it, it's swooped down and it's got him. We're not contending against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against world rulers in this world. And I'm telling you, we have a battle to face this coming year. Stay close to Jesus. He knows how to hide in the, in the rock. And I identify him. It says he's handicapped. He has little power. There's not many of us are wise, not many of us are clever, not many of us. We have got some smart folks in this church. We have got some clever and some, uh, some successful businessmen in this church. Don't lean on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. My time, I could preach on, on any of these animals for the, for the day. And Susan, by the way, you took my last page of my notes. Can I have them back, please? <laughs> 
because Tom whispered in my ear um, about not needing notes. Tom, thank you for that. All right, I don't really need notes, but I'll use them anyway. My third animal, I could just look up here. And would you believe it, this third animal, this third animal is so small, it's a little locust. It's like a little grasshopper. It doesn't carry disease, doesn't bite you. You can hold it in the hand. It's a harmless little creature. In actual fact, you can go to the pet shop and buy a locust and keep it as a pet. So why would God use that? Oh, you don't fancy a locust? <laughs> oh, some people eat them, uh, as we know from John the Baptist. So why would the Bible use this as a creature to teach us wisdom for this coming year? What does it say about the locust? It says, locusts have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. That's all we're told. So what lesson of wisdom could I get from the locusts? Well, forgive me for using preacher's license, but they're self-motivated. They have no king. No one's telling them to do it. No one in this church is going to tell you to be a good boy. No one in this church is going to tell you how to live your life. You should be self-motivated enough, if you love Jesus, to make sure you stay close to the rock and you work hard for him. They haven't got a king. But I'll tell you what, they stick together. Because the locusts, the reason they're hated, in fact, in the Middle East, we have some Middle East folks here. This is the most feared animal ever. More feared than a lion. More feared than any other creature. And the reason they're feared more is because of the numbers they come in. One herd, one shoal, one group of swarm. One swarm. Thank you for coming, whoever yelled that out. One swarm can consume all the food that a village would need for a year. In other words, it will be total oblivion. Means that they will be starving. Means there will be death. They feared the locusts because it stripped everything clean. Every green tree, everything was stripped. They ate the whole thing in a day and then they moved on. They learned to march in ranks. I'll tell you what, I've been, we've got one or two ministers, in fact, several ministers in this church. And the, and the problem we have with Christians, you think they can do it on their own. I did it my way. We need one another, folks, this coming year, and more so because there's more trouble in the world. We need church. We need to lean on one another. Those locusts knew what it was to march in ranks. They were unstoppable. Joel, too, I haven't got time to. But le the lesson I'm, I'm going to get out of this, not in, the, not in the text, but, you know, that's what preachers do. They go outside the text, don't they? So I'm sure one or two of us have done. The locusts are very weak in their wings. They've got very weak wings. They don't travel very far, but they have to travel with the wind. They've got strong legs. But those locusts know when to use their strong legs to leap and ride the air currents to move on to the next place they can devastate. So I'm saying, what are you going to spiritualize out of that? Let me tell you, I can't do it without the Holy Spirit. The wind of the Holy Spirit. I can't move forward without riding the air currents of the Holy Spirit. And those locusts know what it is. They feel the, 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 the nearest wind and they know when to leap and they know that that strong gust of wind will carry them on to the next feast that they can eat. The Bible talks a lot about the Holy Spirit being wind. We don't know where it comes from. We don't know where it's going. But we do know the power thereof. The Bible talks about eagles. We talked about eagles rising on the air currents, rising high. And that's just a picture of what the, what, what the Christians need to do. Rise the air currents. And get up into worship. Rise and soar into the sunlight rays, using both your wings of prayer and praise. Rise like eagles, higher in the sky, and you'll find things look so different when you fly. Help me in this coming year, Lord, to fly the air counts of your Holy Spirit. So instead of being under the circumstances, how are you today? Well, I'm all right under the circumstances. I can be above the circumstances, riding the air currents of the Holy Spirit. First lesson, the ants. Prepare yourself. Second lesson, rock badger or whatever animal, the coney. 
Position yourself in the rock. Third lesson, locusts. Propel yourself. Move out in the Holy Spirit this coming year. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Determine this coming year is going to be better than the previous. Third animal. Again, don't get much smaller than this. The spider. Now, some of you folk... Oh, it's the fourth animal. Susan is very correct in me. It's the fourth one. Thank you, dear. The fourth animal. Now, in the NIV, it's the lizard, but it's the spider in the old version. What on earth could we learn from the spider? A spider can be caught with the hand, yet it is found in king's palaces. I tell you what, get a book on spiders, never mind about ants. Spiders are incredible. They're the thread that they, that they, that they produce. There's not just one type of thread, there's dozens of types of thread. You look into the spider, and it's stronger than steel. If they were able to replicate what a spider produces with its thread, it will be stronger than steel. I haven't been able to do that yet, but they're working on it. Incredible, this little spider can be caught in the hand, and yet it's found in King's palaces. My time is moving on because I want to finish with communion. The last day of this year, Moving into the new year, I want to say, Lord, I want to make sure that I'm wiser next year than I was this year. I want to make sure, Lord, that I stay close to the rock. I want to make sure, Lord, that I position myself. But what about this spider? He's found in king's palaces. Oh, I don't know about you, but my Bible says I'm a child of the king. You can call me King Killick. I don't mind. That was a joke. King killing crime. But my Bible says that our position in Christ is seated with him far above all principalities and powers. I love that Old Testament story of a cripple. Am I allowed to use that word now, cripple? Is that non kosher word? Disabled. Oh, he's not in. I shouldn't use the word cripple, right? A disabled person. And as a little baby, he had to run for his life and the nurse dropped him while he was running away from a person that they thought was going to kill him. Let me just fill in the background, some of you know anyway. When a king in the Old Testament uh, died or moved on and another king took over, very often the whole of the king's family were killed. And when King Saul was killed in battle and his son Jonathan, this little child in the family called Mephibosheth, was taken by the nurse and they ran away because they thought David would surely kill this little child. And the nurse dropped the baby, crushed his leg, didn't have orthopedic surgery while we have in this church here. And the child was a disabled person for the rest of his life. So when King David took over the throne, he was best friends with Jonathan. That was Saul the king who tried to kill him. His, his son and him were best friends. You, some of you Bible writers folks know this story. And he simply asked the question, is there anyone in Jonathan or in Saul's family that I can bless? And somebody said, yes, there's that little cripple boy. I'm sorry. There's that, that Mephibosheth. He's still alive. So David got a whole bunch of army. And they marched off to where this little boy, this crippled boy, was living. And you imagine the nurse looking at this army coming. He's come to kill us. The nurse would get it as well as the little Mephibosheth. But what was David doing? He said, bring that boy, that disabled boy. I'm going to make him a ruler in my palace. He's going to eat at the king's table from now on. He's going to be as wealthy as anyone in my kingdom. And little Mephibosheth sat and ate at the king's table from then on, and he became a prince. Feared for his life, but he became a prince. Now, why do I tell you that story? If you love Jesus, and I believe you do, that makes you a prince, makes you precious, it makes you, it makes you valuable. Whatever anybody else may say about you, they called me big ears when I was young, now they call me baldy or whatever. Whatever name they might call me, I know that who I am in Christ, you can call me whatever you like, but I'm a child of the King. Jesus loves me. He loves me. But you say, you can't love me, I'm a failure. If you knew how, I, how I'd failed, I'm not going to tell you. 
nor does my wife, thank God. If you knew some of the stuff that goes on in me, I'm, in me dwells no good thing, the Bible says. But God loves me. I'm one of his kids. Not only that, he calls me a prince, he calls me king, a queen. He's placed me in the king's palace and one day I'm going to sit at the table with Jesus. And in a moment we're going to come to the table that reminds us of that. And kids, you can do this as long as the parents come with you. And we go to a table and we take a little bit of bread and we say, Jesus, King Jesus, you died on the cross for me. That's why we take communion. Because it reminds us that King Jesus, who died on a cross, has made me a king and a prince. I eat that bit of bread and I remember that Jesus died on the cross for me. And then there's some it's kosher bread. It's gluten-free, just for James. It's for you, James. One or two others. And then there's wine. There's proper wine on the table. It's listed, but there's juice for the kids as well. And it's red because it reminds me that Jesus died and shed his blood for me. And now I can sit with Jesus in heaven. So 2024, help me Lord, look to look carefully at how I walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. As I come to this communion table, Lord, help me to forget the past and expect great things for you in this coming year, Lord. Help me to position myself and not lose Lose the fact that I cannot do it on my own. I've got to stay close to Jesus. Help me, Lord, to ride the air current of your Holy Spirit. Wherever you take me, Lord, whatever you want me to do, Lord, let me listen to the voice of your Spirit that I can go where you want me to go this year, Lord. And help me to produce myself like that spider produces a web. Lord, who can I tell about Jesus this coming year? You've listened ever so well, boys and girls. And the grown-ups are not bad either. We're going to pray now. And then the group, while I'm praying, the music group will take communion. And then they're going to play another song for us. And while they do, young people, I want you to find your parents. Or if they're here, if they say it's okay, come with your parents. And family by family, take your own communion. Say, Jesus, let this coming year a year where I stay close to you. Father, thank you for the lessons of your Bible. They're so simple that the youngest child can understand. Thank you, Lord, that you want us to have a great 2024. You want us to do well at school, Lord. You want us to do well at sports. You want our football team to win as well. Lord, more important than all of that, I pray that we can love Jesus more. Do the, be the best we can be for him this coming year. Worship band, just come and take communion, please.